Proudly we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another transcribed program with a cast of outstanding players and featuring as Molly Pitcher, Rosemary Rice. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story as proudly we hail the Women's Army Corps. Out of the yellowed but inspiring pages of American history comes the story of a woman who didn't hesitate to aid her country even to the extent of joining in actual combat. This is the story of a woman whose heroic deeds and service have been shrouded in mixed fact and legend, but whose emerging spirit has been a constant symbol to the women of America. This is the story of Molly Pitcher. After this important message, our first act curtain will rise. If you're a woman over 18 and under 34 years of age, your help is needed in the Women's Army Corps. You're needed to serve alongside the men of the United States Army. Why not visit your local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station? Have a talk with a local recruiter and learn all the facts. Remember, your country needs you now. And now, with Rosemary Rice in the title role, your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, Molly Pitcher. There was nothing really special in what I did. There was need of me, and I was there. It was a time of emergency. It was my duty. Molly Pitcher, the daughter of John Ludwig, was born on a dairy farm between Princeton and Trenton, New Jersey, on October 13, 1754. She was christened Mary, but was nicknamed Molly by friends and neighbors when a child. Historians, although sketchy about many things concerning her, all agree, however, that she was brusque but kindly. When she was 15, her gracious kindliness, her patience with children, and her willingness to work won her a position in the home of the well-known Dr. William Irving and his family in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. That same year, Molly married John Casper Hayes, a barber with a shop near the Irving home. To secure their marriage for the future, Molly had continued working at the Irvings. But now, six years later, in 1775, there was little security of any kind throughout the 13 colonies. Petitions to London for fair treatment, adequate representation, and a limited self-government had been answered by warships and troops. Colonists had been fired upon. Punitive decrees had been issued. There was nothing left now but a fight for full freedom and independence. Molly, I'm joining an artillery unit tomorrow. John, you're what? I'm enlisting. It's time. John, you're not a soldier. (laughs) A man becomes a soldier. But you're not. You're the best barber in all of Pennsylvania. Molly, a moment now, my dear. Yes, you are in all of Pennsylvania. Here, now. Put down these basins and let me tell you. What do you know about artillery? (laughs) Nothing, Molly, dear. Absolutely nothing. Please, put down these basins. There. Now tell me. Molly, dear... Tell me why you must stop being a barber, the best in Pennsylvania, to do something with artillery. My dear, I wouldn't know a cannon from a shepherd's shears. Well, then... But I'll you learn... You spent years learning to be a barber, the best barber yes, in all... Yes, yes, dear, I know. The best barber in Pennsylvania. It's true, John. Others can learn to fight. Others can learn about cannons. No, Molly. No, my dear. This will take all of us. It means every one of us, men, women, and even children. Every one of us. But why you? This means more than my being a barber or a grocer or anything else. It means my very right to be a barber or a grocer or anything else I want to be. But no one or anything in London can... This is no longer London or the king or his government. We have been fired on in Boston. 
people like us because we have dared ask for, for a voice in our own affairs, for a measure of freedom. Charles, I don't want you hurt. Oh, Molly, in God's care and with your love, I... Well, I'll even learn about artillery. John's leaving hung like a heavy weight on Molly's strong shoulders. They had talked more about the issues facing not only themselves, but the thousands and thousands of others who must now face the same problems. But Molly felt she couldn't work in Carlisle anymore with John away. This was a time of decision. Mrs. Irving. Yes, Molly. Um, the children are taking their nap. Fine. I don't know how you do it. Oh, they're good children. Perfect children, but just perfect enough to be little terrors. But why they will take their nap for you and no one else, I don't know. Oh, I like to tell them a story ah, first. Little sticks, I just think you're a magician with children. I... Oh, Molly, you've been crying. Is something wrong? Well, yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Well, I certainly think I know what it is. Here, wait until I put this old yarn down. There. Now, Molly, you sit down right here. I... You don't have to tell me. I know exactly what it is. John is left for the, for the war, and you are lonesome, and you miss him, and it's only three days since he's gone, and you're worried, and so on. Yes, ma'am. Can I... Yes, yes, I know. You go home each night, and his shop is closed, and you don't hear the sound of his honing his razors for tomorrow, and... You can't cook for yourself because he's not there to eat with you, and you can't get to sleep because you don't know where he is or how he is. And you suddenly feel as though your part of the world had dropped away. Yes, ma'am. And I don't want to stay in Carlisle anymore. Excuse me, ma'am. That's quite all right, but Molly, my dear. It's very understandable. You've been so kind. I don't know what to do exactly, but... But staying in Carlisle isn't what I want. Come, then, dry your tears. We will go see the doctor. He may have an idea. Now, I, I hope he's free. He did have that old reprobate Silas Turner in there again. He always needs at least an hour with that gouty old fool. Old Silas probably is still trying to convince the doctor that the only cure for gout is to wean infants on brandy and thus develop a tolerance for spirits. My! Now, now remember, Molly. You have a home here with us if you want it. Yes, ma'am. I'll remember. Yes? Uh, are you free, Will? Yes, dear. Come in, come in. <laughs> I, uh, I have just rejected Silas Turner's new invention, a specially shaped spoon for feeding brandy to babies. Will, this is important. It really is. No. Oh. Well, by the looks of Molly's... Reddened eyes, I can see that. Mm, it's it's about John. What? Well, no bad news already. Oh, oh no, sir. Thank heavens, no will. But Molly is distressed about his leaving and just about doesn't know what to do. Well, here, here, here. There's no use just standing there. Come on, both of you. Sit down. Oh, sit down. Sit there, dear. That's it. <laughs> oh. Now, Molly is my patient. What is it, my dear? Dr. Irving, things aren't quite the same for me since John left. I won't cry anymore because of his leaving. I know he had to go, but I... I... Go on, child. I know how important it was for him to go. But here in Carlisle, I, I'm always reminded of his leaving. Everything here reminds me of, of how happy we've been. Now remember, Molly, we have been very happy about you and John. He's one of the finest young men we have ever met. And you are as close to us as our children. But today, thousands of fine young men like John are out in the woods and the fields and the mountain passes defending our rights and fighting to gain us happiness and dignity of free people. However best you feel you can serve our cause and aid John... You yourself must decide. Whatever you decide, Molly, dear, we will help you. And when John one day returns, always remember, we'll be waiting for both of you. Oh, thank you. Thank you from my heart, sir. I feel I should go back to my father's farm. John is near there. 
And I want to be near John. He may need me. From every record of these historical events we can find, it was obvious at this point that Molly had adjusted to John's leaving to join the forces fighting for freedom. As she left the Irvine family in Carlisle, her determination to be near her husband was uppermost in her mind. She was back home now at her father's farm. Molly! Hello, Molly! Yes, Father. Uh, Molly, you are still there? Of course. Much to do. Still two gallons left. It is too much, Liebchen. Oh, this batch. Almost finished. Yeah, Molly, but we have enough now. Oh, an extra batch. Won't hurt. Good, good, yeah, but Ooh. you're working too hard. No, I'm not tired. I know, I know, but every day you wake up with the sun. I get more done that way. You get more done, and I have nothing to do now. <laughs> you do enough, Father. Now you are here. I'm an old man. I do nothing. The milk is your work, the chickens you take care of, the garden, the kitchen, everything. Whew. There, Father. There's another batch finished. Good, Marley, but now is enough. We, we don't need more. No, I want to keep busy. I know, but you must sometime rest, too. No, Father, I don't want to rest. When I do, I... I keep thinking that somehow I should be where John is helping him. Liebchen, come here. Come here, put your head on my shoulder. So, Father, Father. So, 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 so. How can I help John? How? How? I don't know. I, I don't know, Liebchen. You can understand now, Father, why? Why I couldn't stay in Carlisle. Why I couldn't stay where I'd be reminded every minute that, that John was away, that we were separated, that he might be in danger and I wasn't there with him. Molly. Liebchen, today, tomorrow, many thousands like John, young men, old men, are away from home, fighting, fighting for a word, a big word, a big idea, a word and an idea we could never talk about in Europe, freedom. I know, Father. I know it. I know it so well. And what am I doing to help? What? Oh, Father, nothing, nothing, nothing. Maybe it would be better you should stay in Carlisle. There was a good job with the doctor, no? Oh, no, Father. Here I'll be closer to where John is. And then if he needs me, I can help. I'll go to him. <laughs> From month to month and even year to year, no one could tell exactly where the elusive and swift-moving American forces would be, usually outnumbered by British and hired Hessian troops possessing superior strength and firepower, the scattered units and armies of General George Washington relied on ambush, surprise attacks, and strategic withdrawals to confuse an enemy accustomed to the more orthodox methods of warfare. Then. Three years after John had left and Molly had returned to her father's farm, she had news. Father! 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 Yeah, yeah, Molly. Where are you, Father? Here, here, Molly, upstairs. Uh, Wait, I come down. No, 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 I'll come up. No, Molly, what is it? Father, John is only 30 miles away. And the British have left Philadelphia, and he's a cannoneer, and they're retreating towards the coast, and he hasn't been hurt. And General Washington expects to meet the British somewhere near Freehold. Now, uh, wait, Molly. And, and, Father, this runner said that he'll be back sometime after nightfall, and I can ride with him to John, and it's a wagon with two horses. Now, and, wait, but Molly. But, Father, now I can go but see first John. First, you take a breath. I can help him because first I... First, you take a breath. Oh, Father, come, I... Come, come, come. In. <gasps> Hold it. One. Two. Three, out. <sighs> Father, uh, once let me more. Oh. In. Hold it. One, two, three, out. <sighs> now, talk. Father, I was out at the roadside, rounding up old fatty that that stubborn hen with the limp. When up the road comes this team of horses and a wagon and an old man driving. 
I, I don't know who looked more tired and thinner and old, he or the horses. Uh, yeah, so? <laughs> well, what they needed was, was feed and water, and I gave them enough for the horses and the old man. Uh, so? So, he said he was a runner. And he was up this way to pick up some men who had gone home to get over their wounds. It might be well by now. And he was going to take them back, he said, to Washington's army over near Freehold. Yeah, yeah, and uh, what about John? Father, he told me about John. Uh, Molly, so many rumors we hear in three No, years. Father, no, no, I know this isn't a rumor. Uh, oh, Molly. And the runner said he knew a John Hayes who was a cannoneer with an artillery unit. And he told me what he looked like. And I know it's John, all right, I know it. Molly, maybe you should better wait a few days. Father, of course not, after all this time, and John now so near. But, Liebchen, it will be dangerous. There's battle coming, for sure. And I hope I can get there on time. There? There's no place for a woman. Father, if John can be there, I can, too. You know, it sounds wonderful, Molly, but maybe a woman is in the way. I know I won't be, Father. I'm going there to help, and I'll help in any way I can. Rosemary Rice, featured as Molly Pitcher in this Proudly We Hail production, will return in just a moment for the second act. Here is a most important message for young women listening to this radio program. If you're between the ages of 18 and 34 and qualify, you can prove that this is a woman's world, too. How? By enlisting in the WAC, Women's Army Corps. By joining right now when you're needed most and when the opportunities for advancement are greatest, You'll be serving your country well, and yourself too. You'll have opportunities for some of the finest specialized training in the world, training which will serve you well should you elect to return to civilian life. You'll enjoy the same pay, allowances, medical care, vacations, and opportunities for travel as the men in the service. But most of all, you'll have the inner satisfaction of knowing you are serving your country when the need is urgent. So serve as American men serve. Do your part in keeping America strong. Visit your local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and enlist in the WAC, Women's Army Corps. Do it now. You are listening to Proudly We Hail. And now with Rosemary Rice in the title role, we present the second act of Molly Pitcher. After almost three years of waiting and hoping, Molly Pitcher at last feels she's definitely located her husband, John Casper Hayes, who had enlisted in an artillery unit in late 1775. A runner for the American Revolutionary Forces, meeting Molly by chance at the roadside near her father's farm, has offered to give her a lift to Freehold, where Washington's army awaits an attack from British and Hessian troops. John, the runner said, was there. I am here. Good, right on time. Can we put this in the wagon? Expect so. Uh, what is it? It's really two boxes. Both are full of bread, cold meat, and sausages. Oh, uh, makes this something like a bit of a holiday. They're sure big. One box is for you and your passengers, if mm. you have any, and the other, the other is for my husband. Oh, well, here, ma'am, let me take. Oh, <laughs> oh let me help you. Oh yeah, my goodness. Uh, Ma'am, are you sure you're not bringing your husband a half dozen cannonballs? <laughs> I hope my fresh bread isn't that bad. Well, uh, now, there. here we are. Whew, both are in back, just behind your seat. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Ma'am. Well, I guess we better get now. May I ride up on the seat with you? Oh, sure, sure. Here, just step on this, Ma'am. All right, thank you. I can make it. <laughs> Uh, there's an old blanket up there you can wrap around you. It'll keep out the night chill. Oh, thank you. I, I found it. Yeah. Well, ma'am, we ain't, uh, we ain't going to go fast, but we'll travel at a steady pace. That's good. All right, you two. Let's get... Come on, come on. Will the trip take long? Oh, well, uh, well, we ain't taking any direct road, and uh, the roads we take ain't so good. I know, but and I... And we'll uh, pull up for a spell to water and feed the horses, yes. you see. I... Grease that back right hub. I see, but Then I... there's a, uh, a stretch of road up ahead of piece there that ain't good riding. I see We'll it. I uh, slow not... up there, you see, because those lads sleeping in the back are just fresh over some wounded. Yeah, uh... They ain't able to take much jouncing. Well, when do you think... Well, uh... Now, as near as I can tell, we might hit Freehold Smack in the forenoon. 
I hope we're there before anything starts. Oh, I feel the same way, ma'am. Had us a load of 40 muskets and 400 weights of powder in back there. Should be mighty useful when we get the freehold. <laughs> you got your heart pretty well set on finding your man, ain't you, ma'am? Yes, I have. Yeah. Well, he's there all right, ma'am. <laughs> He'll likely turn a pretty cartwheel when he sees you. And I've wanted so much to see him, too. I've always believed that, that there's so much that all of us must do. John taught me that, and I've never forgotten it. Are you still at it, Hayes? Yeah, still at it, Adams. But I have five kegs open now. I never saw a man fussier about his powder kegs. Ah, uh, my dear Moore, I hate trying to open these at the last minute. Sure you uh, have enough open now uh, to conduct a little battle of your own. I don't know why he needs a cannon or cannonballs. He'll meet the enemy head on and throw powder in the faces. <laughs> I may have to do it with this heat today. This old cannon will be useless after an hour's firing. Hey, hot enough to melt a musket ball. Well, speaking about this heat, what are we supposed to do? Just sprawl out here in this field and bake? Well, General Green's aide said we'll get it at high noon, or shortly thereafter. Well, what's taking them so long? They know we're here. Maybe their uniforms had to be pressed. All our men out there in the open. They'll be baked and fried by the time there's action. Yeah, this is a day for a swim. Hmm. But where do we get the water, by the way? Huh? Oh, over there, back of you. That silly-looking thing's a well. <laughs> Complete with an artistically battered pewter pitcher. <laughs> oh, say. Hey, look there. Isn't that old man beetle-eyes in his wagon? And unless this heat has already affected me, there's a woman standing up in front. It is a woman, all right. Seems to be looking for someone, too. Looks mm. like she's seen him, <laughs> And that big package she's got. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to feed well today. She's heading straight across the... Wait. John! John! Oh, bless the Lord. It's Molly. Now, how can a man run like that in this heat? Just look at that package of food she's carrying. Hey, no, no, look at that. Hey, they don't care who knows. The most charming scene I've ever witnessed on a <laughs> battlefield. <laughs> Hey, that stopped him. Well, that kiss was something the red coat should have seen. <laughs> Might even have held their fire till it was over. He, here the two come running back. The package. <laughs> oh, they better be careful. Be careful. Oh. My. Oh. oh, what a run. Yeah, and this package is no lady's fan. <laughs> oh, men, my wife Molly. Molly, this is Adams and... This is Moore. In honor, ma'am. Doubly so, ma'am. Uh, how, how do you do? Moore is extra polite whenever somebody's got food <laughs> package. Politeness, ma'am, is bread on the waters, uh, I think. Oh, John, bread. Bread, of course. Oh. I have fresh bread in there and cold meats and sausages. Sauce? May we open it now? Oh, let, let me open it. Oh, fine. Come on, let's, let's sit down right here next to this uh, elegant piece of equipment. All right. Is that... Your cannon, John? Well, Molly, dear, I can't claim it as a personal possession, but I've been a good nursemaid to it. As we're waiting for it to melt in this heat. <laughs> well, here. Everything's ready. I I hope you're all hungry. Oh, oh, ice is oh, oh, Can you imagine that? Oh, let's take a look here, fellas. The blazing sun beat down on the widely deployed American troops as they waited for the British and Hessian forces of Sir Henry Clinton to strike. More than a mile from the great open field, Clinton kept his army cool in the protection of willow and beech groves. Washington's army had to be met and defeated to permit the British a safer retreat to the coast. On June 28, 1778, in the searing heat of mid-afternoon, British and Hessian forces marched out of their protective groves in perfect formation. Here they come. Hey, back to our post. And good luck. And thank you, ma'am. John, what shall I do? Lie low, Molly, my dear. Very low. Arms! Aim! Fire! Hey, yeah. fire when ready. Yeah. Molly, your ears, dear. All right, John. Uh, 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 Molly, Molly, keep down. Watch your ears now. Uh, John, John, can I help? What shall I do? 
Nothing, dear. John, you need water. I'll get it up there at the well. No, no, Molly. No, Molly, stay down. I'll bring it. I'm all right, John. Here, John, water. Oh, my Molly. Let me take some to Adams over there. He's been hit. Molly now increased her trips to the well for water. The pewter pitcher traveled from wounded man to tired rifleman, and soon the shouts went up. Here's Molly! Here's Molly with the pitcher! Molly with the pitcher! Oh, Molly! Molly pitcher! And thus, one of America's greatest nicknames was born in the heat of battle, Molly Pitcher. But now, Molly stopped her water fetching and rushed to the side of her fallen husband, victim of a wound and heat exhaustion. John! 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 Molly, I'm hit. I... Not much, just this heat. I... John, here, here's water. Oh, rest, oh. John, dear, rest. Now, first the swab, <laughs> then the charge. <laughs> and Hessian forces withdrew to the heights of Middletown, beaten back by the sheer spirit of the American troops, sparked by the courageous example of Molly Pitcher. And although honors came to Molly from many sources, it was appointment as an honorary sergeant in the American army by General George Washington, which touched her heart most. And the words of Molly Pitcher still live on to inspire the women of America today. There was nothing really special in what I did. There was need of me, and I was there. It was a time of emergency. It was my duty. Thank you, Rosemary Rice, for a very stirring portrayal. Now here is an important message to the young women of America. A brief word to young women. Why not get an early start with a job that gives you the feeling of being of real service to your country? You'll enjoy that feeling in the Women's Army Corps, and you'll be doing a job that will be a little different every day. You'll be getting the finest specialized training in the world in the career field in which you're best qualified. So don't let opportunity pass you by. Remember, today young women between the ages of 18 and 34 can best serve their nation by working side by side with the men of the services. Visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting service and get all the details today. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station by the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This program featured Rosemary Rice. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>